So the last couple of videos on here have been delving into the world of Japanese wrestling. And I must say that like, the response to them has been unbelievable. I'm so glad that you've all made them such a success. However, I'm sure there's plenty of you who are jonesing for a little bit more content from the world of old and forgotten British computer games. And as ever, I'm more than happy to provide. So, here's something. I want you to think through the history of games that presented themselves as cinematic, multimedia spectacles. Stuff that's often more cutscenes than they are games, but can be pretty impressive nonetheless. Everything from, let's say, Detroit to Become Human, through to Until Dawn, going back further now, maybe Fahrenheit, The Bouncer, Phantasmagoria, still further, Seventh Guest, Night Trap, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, all the Cinemaware classics. But now we're going to go back even further than that. With all of these games in mind, I want to ask you, what do you think such a game would look like on the ZX Spectrum? A big, impressive movie-esque blockbuster in all of 48 kilobytes? Are such things even conceivable? Well, yes they are. In fact, there's some perfectly good or at least interesting games that could qualify, which I'm saving for another day. I could easily class The Lords of Midnight as such a game. It's a platform-defining RPG that's considered one of the greatest games on the spectrum, but I'm saving it for when we finally get around to covering the legendary Mike Singleton. Deus Ex Machina is an even more blatant example. It's a freaking game and an audio play all in one for heaven's sake. But again, I want to save that for the eventual coverage of the irreverent brilliance of Automata and Mel Croucher. No, what we have instead is something bad. All the games that I listed may not necessarily be high on gameplay, but they have their merits, whereas the game we're covering is a bad one. The equivalent of a corpse killer, or even a plumbers don't wear ties. A definite stinker. A much hyped stinker at that. The magazines of the early 80s were gagging for it, the players were very curious, it came out, and everyone at once collectively asked what the hell this crap was even all about. Yep, we're finally looking at the Great Space Race. Every game needs a software house, of course, and today's software house is a bunch of folks called Legend, operating out of Chinford in London. Their head was a man named John Peel, not to be confused with the almighty Radio 1 disc jockey, and he, well, he wasn't exactly shy of the press. And in all honesty, after their first game, he didn't have much reason to be. Legend got noticed through an adventure game called Valhalla, which was actually really quite good. They hyped up an engine called Moviesoft, which, in their words, allowed them to create as realistic and as cinematic an experience as was possible on the humble specy. Now how much of this was actually true, and how much of it was just hot air? That's up for debate, but while Valhalla may not exactly look like much now, it was a pretty big deal in 1983. Legend made the ballsy decision of selling this game at the hefty price point of £14.95p, and it managed to work out. Magazine reports suggest that Legend made a couple of million pounds from sales of the game on the Spectrum, and a bit more on top of that later on for a C64 port. Valhalla won plenty of praise in magazines, and even a few Game of the Year awards into the bargain. So suddenly these folks from Chinford were major players, and people were pretty excited about their next project. The hype train for the Great Space Race started in August of 1984, a few months before it touched down for the holidays. In the mags of the time, John Peel said that the game would be a spectacular futuristic romp, complete with sophisticated 3D animations produced by their new engine, Movisoft 2. All of this meant that apparently the game cost a quarter of a million pounds to make, which is, well, a pretty large amount for any game in 1984, let alone a ZX Spectrum game. But the Great Space Race would be like a movie on the specy, he said. Characters would either make their own decisions or you'd be able to choose their path. They'd have moving eyes and lips. I mean, they'd basically be real people. Okay, he didn't necessarily say that last one, but the Great Space Race promised much more than most games did. Perhaps the only other UK micro games that had been quite hyped so much in the press before this were Imagine's ill-fated mega games. John Peel boasted that the BBC micros that they were creating their games on were too weak to actually handle what they were creating. He was really going full on at it. 
He confidently predicted that the game would be scooping up Game of the Year awards just as Valhalla had done the previous year. The Great Space Race would be out in September on both the ZX Spectrum and then, a little later, on the Commodore 64 for the cost of $14.95. It ended up delayed, a little, but it was out by Christmas time. The game itself comes in a big box, complete with a big manual that also doubles up as a comic, telling you the stories of the characters involved. The game takes place in a galaxy that operates entirely on a drink called Natoff. Everyone consumes the stuff so much that it's the de facto currency. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to pick a team of four mercenaries and deliver Natoff to every planet in the galaxy, 96 of them to be precise. Along the way you'll encounter other mercenaries who'll want to thwart your progress, along with space pirates and peacekeeping forces. And everyone has their own personality. If you read the backstories in the manual, you'll figure out who likes whom and who hates each other. It's all very exciting. So, you load it up and get right into the first part. You see the portraits of each mercenary, and then you have a set amount of time to choose your team and their weaponry. This is obviously quite exciting. I mean, sure it's a bit odd that an interactive movie program like this would use so much basic spectrum text, but perhaps that's just easing you in before you take off and the game blows you away. You carefully make your choices based on the look of the people, the hippie-ish germ, slaphead haberdaber, suit and tied noxin, pigtailed mina, leather goddess falcon, and you know those eyes and lips do move. A little. Like, they go up and down a bit every now and again. But suddenly, it all starts. There's a countdown. Three, two, one. Let the great space race begin. <sighs> so yeah, um, this is it. You can look at the view that each of your four characters have, although they aren't appreciably different. You just get a couple of ships and a space station. The characters just kind of go about their business. They're each assigned to a different arm of the galaxy, Alpha, Beta, Data and Gamma, and they just move along, basically, delivering consignments of Natoff to a planet if they haven't been there yet. You don't have much choice at all. Occasionally one will ask you if you want them to move inward or outward or teleport somewhere else. Sometimes the game asks you if you want to sober a character up because they've drunk too much Natoff, or you have to repair a ship. Occasionally one of the mercs will tell you a password for some wreck on a planet that you need to make a note of. If you so happen to reach that wreck, you can choose that password for a reward. Which is just a bit more nate off. In the words of Richie from Bottom, it's not very sexy, is it? But then, suddenly, a rival merc comes at you and wants some nate off, or they'll attack. Now naturally you aren't going to pay them a damn fin, so it's time to face off. Finally, this must be where the arcade action comes in. This must be the big 3D space battles that Legend promised. So yeah, enough talk. Have at you! Well, yeah, that sure was a battle. That's it. Just a few annoying beeps and these shapes just appearing in different places on the screen. Was this the sophisticated 3D animation that Legend and John Peel had hyped up so much? Because there sure hasn't been anything at all like that anywhere else in the game. Need I remind you, by the way, that this came out at virtually the exact same time as another game that was set in the space and featured a mercenary trading goods across the galaxies. That game being Elite. This game is not elite. You have no control over anything in the battle sections, by the way. Once you've seen one, you've seen the lot. Either you defeat the enemy and he buggers off, they defeat you and you have to pay the ransom, or, and this is where, one or the other ship gets destroyed. This scene repeats endlessly. Eventually the game might come to an end. Usually this happens when you stop bothering to repair your ships, disabling them and taking them out of the waste, or you decide to just take wild guesses when you come to the booby trap to X, inevitably blowing your ship up. Anything to bring this game to a close. There's no way that anyone but the most dedicated of fools would actually see this game through to its proper end and deliver to all 96 planets. So just to clarify, there's virtually no game at all here. The only interaction you have with the program is the occasional binary choice, and you know what, you don't even have to do that. 
You can, if you wish, just let the timer run out on each choice and let the computer make the decision, watching what happens, just like a movie, if you're sadomasochistic. The quality of the drawings on offer don't really matter all that much, when there's nothing to actually be done with them. The big backstories in the manual about the characters and their relationships with each other? In practice, all that really comes down to is, character X has more chance of attacking character Y than character Z. And in case you couldn't tell by the way, remove the stuff in the middle and all you have is an utterly basic game written mostly in basic with perhaps a little bit of assembly for the movie soft stuff. And apparently this cost a quarter of a million pounds in 1984. I mean, what on earth did they spend that on? Did they get their dev computers gold plated? Were hookers and blow on standby to get the programming team through crunch time? Did the head of legend add the cost of his brand new Porsche onto the game's budget? Now none of these would surprise me in that day and age, but whatever that money went on, sure isn't reflected in the game, which is just a mix of basic programming, some hand-drawn portraits, and a few mock 3D knock-ups on graph paper. That's it. The Great Space Race. You won't find a bigger hype job in the micro era when it comes to how much the game promised, and what an absolute load of nothing it ended up being. And sure enough, the magazines were quick to absolutely tear it apart. This game was mocked to high heaven. Even in these fairly lax times for game critique and appraisal, the Great Space Race was eviscerated. And by the way, Legend, I need to remind you, were trying to sell this game for the grand cost of £14.95. This thing that you can't do anything with, that's mostly in basic. The Great Piss Take is an alternative title that springs to mind. Naturally, following the game's critical reception, no one was going to pay that astronomical price. The game was a humongous flop on the ZX Spectrum, and the reported C64 version that was going to come a bit later, never ended up coming out. Even years later, magazines were still bringing The Great Space Race up as one of the very worst games ever to be released on the micros, right down there with the likes of World Cup Carnival and Cassette 50. What a spectacular fall from grace this was. It's true that you're only as good as the last game you make, and after the success of Valhalla had made Legend a company to watch, the Great Space Race turned them into one of the biggest jokes in the industry. In the end, Legend had to recall thousands of unsold copies of the game at a cost to them of around 200 grand. So yeah, ouch. So what happened to this newly ruined and virtually destroyed software company? It's kind of hard to say. They did release one other game in 1985, a shoot 'em up called Complex. John Peel did make more appearances in the press, although he was purposefully trying to not hype the game up as much as he did the Great Space Race. But with all these outlandish promises followed by attempts to shut himself up, it's hard not to think of him as a microcomputer version of Peter Molyneux, although to be blunt Molly has a fair bit more talent. Hype or not, it didn't work out. Complex had more gameplay and was clearly a much better game than Space Race, but it still wasn't reviewed well, nor did it sell that well. But it wasn't over there. John Peel and Legend did hit the hype train hard for their next game, Complex City, appearing in a bunch of magazines, still trying to atone for the shambles that was the Great Space Race, protesting they knew that it was unfinished garbage, but that the distributors were breathing down their necks and wanted it out for Christmas anyway. This game would be different. However, Complex City never came out. It simply disappeared. It did end up getting one very positive review from Sinclair user, but nothing else. Legend just left the table in late 1985 with no explanation as to what happened. The game itself did actually exist. A copy of the tape was found and a TCX file dumped onto the internet in February 2018. As it goes, it's a perfectly decent and fast-paced tunnel shooter. Not a bad game at all. Shame that it didn't come out. There is basically no detail on what happened to Legend. One can only assume that the money ran out in some way. Perhaps they weren't able to find a distributor for Complex City and not having enough money to release it themselves, decided to hand it up. The high price of their products didn't help. They protested again that they would be selling games at the discounted price of 9 95 after the failure of Space Race. But then 9 95 was generally the premium price point for full price spec tiles anyway, so not much of a discount. Valhalla did end up re-released as part of Elite Systems 299 Classics range a couple of years later, so perhaps they scooped up Legends IPs and games whenever the bottom fell out of the company. Needless to say, they didn't bother reissuing the Great Space Race. 
The legend story is interesting. Another micro case of immediate success bringing in bags of money, lots of big hype for the next game in the press, followed by the company going from heroes to zeros in the blink of an eye. The cost of failing to deliver on such hype can be fatal, and as with many others, they weren't able to recover from the disaster. I am somewhat willing to believe, mind, that Space Race was a game that just got out of hand. After promising so much, the horrid realisation came that the game wasn't going to deliver, and inevitably, especially in those days when major delays were unthinkable, there wasn't enough time to fix it. I say this because, well, surely the game that arrived on shelves was not the title envisaged by its creators. I mean, surely to God. And so there you have it. Perhaps one day we'll tire of riches to rags stories like this, of the hype trains being derailed, and the newly minted cocky young programmer suddenly getting pelted with tomatoes and walked through the streets with cries of shame. But that's not likely to happen anytime soon, is it? <laughs>